This is CBC Here and Now. A season cut short. Fire has destroyed this fish plant in St. Mary's Bay. What the loss will mean to the communities coming up on Here and Now. And I think people all over the province, you could hear the collective groan and the rolling of eyes like, oh yeah, here we go again. Tonight, reaction to patronage. This after a liberal insider gets a top job at the rooms. But first, let's get to our top story, a devastating blow to St. Mary's Bay. Yes, fire demolishes a local fish plant, putting dozens of jobs in jeopardy. Here now is Katie Breen has that story. This is what's left of the fish plant in O'Donnell's. You can see the fire ripped clear through. Crews got the call around 1.30 this morning. When they arrived, the building was totally in flames and Fire Chief Tony Daly was worried about all the explosive materials inside. Propane tanks usual in the fish plant, uh, forklift tires and uh, refrigeration gases. But we were concerned about a diesel fuel tank over on the other side of the plant. Boats, livelihoods, just meters away. The roof collapsed, leaving it too dangerous to go inside. At its worst, they had five hoses running into the ocean, pumping water. There were little explosions, according to the chief, but thankfully, nothing major went off. Well, the risk was still there. We just didn't endanger no lives. We stayed back a distance and uh, poured water on it. Nobody was hurt. The boats were safe, but the building was destroyed. In this area, it's probably the only industry. Hickey & Sons Fisheries Limited employs around 60 to 80 people at the plant. They mainly processed cod this year, but in the past they've done whelk, and until recently they made fries for Ziggy Peel Goods, a year-round operation. It's going to be big in, uh, in this part of the bay uh, uh, because they, they're, they're steady. They were steady employers, you know, and I, I, the people will have to leave, I guess, if they're going to work in plants, unless the plant gets uh, rebuilt pretty quickly. The plant owners didn't want to talk today. They said it was a sad day for their family, the communities, and the workers. People who now won't be able to qualify for employment insurance, a financial hit. The season wasn't over. Workers were waiting on another shipment of cod to come in. Now they're waiting to hear what's next, and the hope is that the plant will be rebuilt. Katie Breen, CBC News, O'Donnell's. New details and reaction tonight to a Here and Now investigation that we brought you last night. It all surrounds a controversial new hire at the rooms. Now, critics are calling it political patronage. Former longtime Liberal staffer Carla Foote is now the executive director of marketing and development at the rooms. And this is a job that comes with a salary of $132,000, the second highest paying job after the CEO. Now, Foote has deep Liberal connections. She used to be a top communications employee for the Liberals in opposition. She's also the daughter of Lieutenant Governor Judy Foote, a former federal Liberal cabinet minister. Now, the nub of all this is that she landed the position without any competition. The job wasn't posted, and no other potential candidates had a chance to apply. Now, Minister Chris Mitchell-Moore says that's because there was an urgency to fill the role. However... In 2016, a position similar to the job that Foote now has, the role of Director of Marketing and Development, well, that was posted for an open competition. And a spokesperson for the government tells us that 77 people applied for that job and they interviewed three people. Nobody was offered that job. The job was actually cancelled in December of 2016. Now, Mitchell Moore says the two positions are actually different and that the role of Executive Director has added responsibilities and that justifies it paying $30,000 more than the old job paid. And now both the NDP and the Tories are saying the Liberals have broken a promise to stop political appointments. I was really, really disappointed, but I could also, and I think people all over the province, you could hear the collective groan and the rolling of eyes like, oh yeah, here we go again. I mean, this feeds into to the cynicism that exists right now about the whole political process. Uh, this is a very significant job. And why this was not, uh, that they didn't put a call for applications is beyond me. This is an administration who touted itself on openness, fairness, and transparency when it came to senior officials being hired. And in this case, none of those processes were followed at all. So, I mean, obviously, they're just talking about both sides of their faces. Is Miss Foote the best for the job? Perhaps she is, but we will never know this. We will never know that now. Because this is a senior official, a uh, very important position. You go through a, an open call, 
uh, an open screening and then an open interview process. Now, the government is defending its position, saying that Carla Foote developed a lot of experience during the Liberals' The Way Forward campaign and that she led the consolidation of marketing functions across government, resulting in increased efficiencies, effectiveness and success of government marketing activities. Now, back in 2015, Dwight Ball promised to end patronage appointments. It became part of his campaign. But he also spoke out critically in 2015 when he was the opposition leader and the Tories appointed former PC cabinet minister John Ottenheimer as head of Newfoundland and Labrador's housing corporation. Ball said during an interview on Here and Now that all key positions in crown agencies should involve a search for the best people. I think what uh, what's required here is we have a number of crown agencies in our province that we need top-notch people, the best people that we can find for this job. This is really not about John Oppenheimer for me. What I want to know is that the chair, the CEOs, and the people that are in key positions running crown agencies in our po province are the best people that they can get, re regardless of their political affiliation. Now we'll come back to this story in about 25 minutes and dig a little deeper into this controversy. Well, I'm trusting our camera guy to zoom in on this shot because I don't want to get any closer. You are looking at some of the best karate fighters in the world. And this weekend in St. John's, they are throwing down at the world traditional karate championships. Don't go away. After the break, we'll take you there live. Cool. He's got a great assignment yeah. tonight. Yeah. All right, free fights. Yeah. So it's Friday. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to know how things are looking. Is it going to be a nice weekend? or? Well, it's a little bit of a messy start to, uh, well, we'll see today's a little bit part of the weekend. Uh, for parts of the West Coast, if you take a look at the current satellite and radar right now, we can see that onshore flow leading to flurries for the most part along the West Coast. I uh, did see some rain earlier today, uh, but that has changed over to flurries. And then we've got a bunch of showers moving through the Avalon as well. It does look like that will continue as we head through the overnight tonight. But if we take a look at the picture about a half an hour ago in Corner Brook, uh, there's snow on the ground and that doesn't look like that will last very long though. We have a special weather statement in effect across the entire province and that's because the next weather maker moves in Sunday night. With that, we're going to see a big warm up on Monday and it looks like a significant amount of rain on the way too. But I'll have all those details for you and your weekend for forecast coming up in a little bit. Well, the annual Poppy fundraiser for Canada's veterans launched today ahead of Remembrance Day. And this year, the Royal Canadian Legion is passing around a different kind of poppy. A new digital poppy contest aims to get young people involved in the project by meeting them where they are on their phone screens. The Legion's president hopes this will help keep the tradition alive. So a student can download a video or something about remembrance and then they're awarded a digital poppy. So you can use a digital poppy as a background for your Facebook. You can use it on your iPhone, your iPad, whatever. And then it's time stamped and as the 11th of November, it expires. Well, it's been a rough week on the roads here on the Avalon and police are pleading with people to please watch their speeds. The RNC were kept busy responding to a dozen accidents in just a few days. And they were attending to accident victims while also trying to direct rather impatient drivers. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is on this story. And Jeremy, I understand that uh, a lot of people have taken to social media trying to actually shame drivers. So I went through hashtag NL traffic on Twitter and there are hundreds of tweets. So I selected just a few of them. So Don Ware wrote, if it isn't safe to drive the speed limit, it isn't safe and we have to drive for the conditions. Now Sheldon Antle wrote, WTF, no lessons learned in NL traffic. And the next one was from Robert JNL, can't you all, and I'm not allowed to say that word on TV, uh, but slow the hell down. Now Aaron Skinner caught a few drivers making a U-turn on the highway on the outer road and proceeding to drive the wrong way. And then there was this, which is probably one of the worst things I've seen given what happened yesterday, and this was posted to Twitter this morning. Craig Smith took this video just this morning of two vehicles running a red light and in the same intersection, another driver in a rush. This is coming just hours after absolute mayhem on the outer ring road. 
basically what happened with the collision was that a vehicle that was traveling west on the outer ring road uh, lost control. It was heavy rains as we all remember from yesterday and uh, went across the median and into oncoming traffic and collided with uh, basically two vehicles. That crash left a highway full of debris and ultimately caused this wreck. And I guess we're slowing down uh, and just there wasn't enough time and ultimately ended up in another collision, which was quite serious. And we have, uh, there, are, there are individuals who are involved in that one are still in hospital. The RNC were kept busy with a few other car crashes before the night was over. Now, due to this crash, part of the highway was closed until this morning. But one of the most disturbing things was people were still speeding on the highway. Despite a lot of flashing lights, the heavy-footed drivers weren't interested in slowing down. Officers were reporting that uh, they were seeing motorists driving either in the oncoming lane or in the, 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 the current lane, uh, driving at speeds of about 110. Something that doesn't sit well with the RNC. We're telling people to slow down, uh, especially if it's raining. You're coming across an accident where there's dozens of emergency vehicles. Still seeing people speeding through uh, carelessly and without taking the warning of a, of a major accident, that, that just seeing that itself should slow people down. So the police are pleading for patience. Social media sites are doing their best to shame bad drivers. And with car crashes making headlines almost daily, what will it take to get people to practice care when behind the wheel? It's a question that many are asking, but not one that is easily answered. Anthony and Carolyn? Thanks, uh, Jeremy. Well, if you want to uh, see a pointed take on driving in this province, you can check out uh, commentary on our website. Mm -hmm. Comic and cartoonist Veronica Diamond has her own take on how drivers interpret signs and the rules of the road. As you can tell from uh, Jeremy's report there, uh, they need a bit of uh, education when it comes to this. <laughs> All of them. Absolutely. Wow. Well, there's a new development tonight in a bullying and harassment complaint that rocked the small town of Spaniards Bay three years ago and led to a mass resignation within the local fire department. Brenda Seymour shocked the province when she spoke out, alleging she was harassed during her five years as a volunteer firefighter. She said colleagues made comments about her body, threatened to defile her gear, and played a pornographic film during a training seminar. Seymour's complaints eventually made Made it to the province's Human Rights Commission, but were dismissed largely because Seymour waited more than a year to file a complaint. But now a Supreme Court judge has ordered that the commission take a second look and reinvestigate. Well, the jury box is full at Supreme Court in Happy Valley Goose Bay this week, but it's not filled with jurors. 15 people are defending their actions at the Muskrat Falls site, and they're doing it simultaneously. Jacob Barker was there, and he has this report. It was two years ago this week that this happened. With concerns around the imminent flooding of the Muskrat Falls Reservoir, hunger strikes began. Disapproving crowds protested at the entrance to the site. Then this. I opened the gate. I proudly say I opened that gate. I hope I save my culture. Today it's a different scene. The jury box packed with the accused. Unlike others who have had their charges dropped or have received conditional discharges, this group is pleading not guilty to contempt of court for breaching a court-ordered injunction, some on more than one occasion. Up to this point, what's occurred is Nalcor has entered their evidence respecting uh, primarily video evidence and security official evidence going to the presence of individuals at the site and various efforts they did or didn't make with respect to serving and displaying injunctions. Kim Campbell McLean has spent days in court watching that video evidence. She testified this week while holding an eagle feather. When we hold the feather, it's our connection of being close to the creator for strength and courage and wisdom. It's been a long two years of ups and downs waiting for these hearings to take place. Disappointing at times. It's been uplifting at times. Um, it's been um, emotional. Campbell McLean admitted to trespassing in court, but she stands behind what she did. I admitted to trespassing because I was in a, in a colonial uh, structure there where uh, in the white man's law, in the colonialistic uh, law, it says you're trespassing. But in my Aboriginal Indigenous laws, I was not trespassing. That's land that my forefathers uh, walked. They slept in those lands and, and their tilts, they, they trapped there. Well, not everyone the defense wanted to testify this week was able to, as it was hoped. 
So more time does have to be set aside for that and submissions and a date for that will be set in November. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, this morning, the CBC radio team took the St. John's Morning Show on the road. They broadcasted live from O'Donnell High School in Mount Pearl, my former school. Is it? Yes. Great location. <laughs> but before they kicked off the show, Chrissy and Fred had some very important morning announcements to make. First up from the cafeteria, today's special lunch, chicken fingers and fries combo, six dollars. Mm. Mm. That sounds really nice. good. That I'm just great. excited now. Here uh, for recess, with the purchase of a breakfast sandwich and a small milk, you get a free, yes, free small cookie. So check it out, Fred. <laughs> Thank you, Chrissy. I should mention that it's five degrees here in Mount Pearl right now, headed to a high of seven. And rather than read the two announcements that Miss uh, Chislett gave me, I'm sitting at Miss White's desk. I'm going to read the late admission slips. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, Fred would do that, having been late a few times in his own day. Uh, O'Donnell High School actually has its own morning show, so it was very kind to let Chrissy and Fred crash their show. Yeah, it looks like they had a ton of fun. Yeah, they were very good, too. They were very, very good. Fred and Chrissy should be afraid, very afraid. Um, what is glove weather to you? Mondstein. <laughs> it means uh, walking around uh, Kitty Vitty without getting your hands cold. <laughs> Just like me today? <laughs> well, is it cold enough yet for gloves? Yeah, what about mittens? Mm. The debate over gloves versus mittens, and when you start wearing them, coming up next.
Weather update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. Right, a couple of days ago, as we got into weather, I was mentioning it was uh, it was kind of a gloveless day for riding the bike. Today was definitely a glove day, or at least a fingerless glove day. So we're starting to get there, right? Yeah. As far as the gloves definitely. go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all the dry, cold skin and everything is. <laughs> oh yeah, gator out. hands. <laughs> yeah, those are really nice. Yeah. yeah. But and you got out and about today to uh, chat with a few people about that. Yeah, I did uh, just to see if it's time to grab your gloves before you leave the house yet. I want to talk to you guys about whether it's glove weather or not. Oh, for not God, Mary. Well, you've got them in your hand I and have she's them wearing them, so... Oh yeah, but she's a wimp. <laughs> I'm a wimp too because my cap keeps blowing off, so no more <laughs> and no, no. Does glove weather generally mean a change of season to you? Or like what time yeah. of year would you normally yeah. pull them out? Eight degrees. Today. Eight bad. degrees? Yeah. Oh, it's eight degrees there. Right. Yeah. That's what it says. Yeah, this kind of a day. A little windy and a little cool, and if you, you know, if we need them, are, we have them. And my ears are even cold. What does it mean when I say glove weather? What does that mean to you? Oh, just if it's chilly outside. My hands get cold faster than any, any part of me. <laughs> and when would, you, when would you typically pull out your gloves? Oh, just as it starts to get cool, Beginning like around now. <laughs> what is glove weather to you? Uh, Monstain. <laughs> oh, you're tough. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going out for a dog walk, do you normally grab your gloves, or when would you normally grab your gloves? Oh, I'm from Ontario, so this really isn't that cold <laughs> or warm here yet. So I, I don't know here yet because I haven't experienced a winter yet. So not this, not this yet. This is nice out. When I say glove weather, what does that mean to you? Uh, it means uh, walking around the uh, kitty bitty without getting your hands cold. <laughs> Aha, uh -huh, but an imposter, he had mitts on. Yeah. He did have right? mitts on. Folks He's in Lab West are probably like, yeah, what are you talking <laughs> about? Yeah, it's it's not, I mean, I, even out there, I forgot my gloves this morning, and uh, it was a little chilly mm -hmm. in that wind. It's getting Otherwise, to that time. Yeah, nothing compared to oh, no. yellow knife. Uh, no. Right? No, not even close. <laughs> What'd you use up there? Seal skin mitts. It's the Seal warmest. Skin mitts? Yeah. yeah. You just gained 10,000 fans with that, that's good. <laughs> Hey, they are great. <laughs> they yeah. are. Super, uh, super warm. They are very warm. Yeah, you can't mm -hmm. get any better than that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so temperatures, you know, as she mentioned earlier or uh, during that, it was eight degrees today here mm -hmm. in St. John, so not too bad. Uh, and then we saw temperatures earlier today along the West Coast sitting in the single digits, four degrees in Corner Brook, six in Deer Lake. Uh, and then as we take a look at the temperatures right now, they've dropped quite significantly uh, for Corner Brook sitting around zero degrees right now. And then temperatures uh, towards St. John's sitting in the single, mid single digits. We're going to continue to see those temperatures drop as we head through the night tonight. So uh, because those temperatures have dropped, we've seen all of that rain from earlier today change over to snow in that onshore uh, flow. And then we've got all those showers for the Avalon as well. That will continue at least uh, into the overnight and then continue through the first half of tomorrow, it looks like. But uh, if we take a better look at the satellite image, you can see how beautiful that onshore flow is, even though it does come with some flurries and if you were in those flurries it didn't look so nice but from this uh, from the uh, atmosphere higher up in the atmosphere it does look uh, quite beautiful there so if we take a look at the future cast and what we're going to see over the next 24 hours uh, continue with that flurry activity along the west coast pushing towards central as we head through the night tonight and then some uh, showers continuing across the Avalon as well. At least through the first half of tomorrow, we're going to see that risk of flurries along the west coast and then it should clear out as a ridge of high pressure sits uh, just south of the island tomorrow, probably more in the way of cloudy periods through the day, maybe some lingering showers in the first half and then the next weather maker moves in. We'll start to see that cloud cover Saturday night into Sunday uh, as that system continues to push in. Now with this, we could see uh, those temperatures are going to drop in the minus single digits. So the onset of that precipitation could see some freezing rain, uh, mostly for Western it looks like right now. But again, freezing rain, potentially even some ice pellets in the early morning on Saturday or rather early morning on Sunday and then quickly change over to rain as those temperatures jump up quite significantly by uh, Sunday night into Monday. 
We could see temperatures jumping up into the mid-teens through the afternoon. So that's definitely uh, a good news, I guess, if you like the warmer weather. Uh, as far as tonight's forecast goes, we've got those windy conditions continuing across the southwest coast. Uh, in, further inland, we could see a couple of centimeters and up in those higher elevations as well. Generally clearing along the straits. St. Anthony minus one tonight. Windy conditions there as well. Uh, same for Nain. Minus three tonight. Blowing snow and winds gusting upwards of 100 kilometers per hour. So that uh, wind warning is in place there. Uh, otherwise, we're looking at showers down through the Buren and then same for the Avalon. Those winds generally gusty upwards of about 50 kilometers per hour. Now, coming up uh, in a little bit, I will have all the details on how much rain is going to fall, those temperatures, and then uh, we'll look at a longer range forecast. Anthony? Thank you very much, Ashley. Well, there's some serious competition down at mile one tonight, but it's not hockey or basketball for a change. It's uh, martial arts, karate. Yes, the world traditional karate do championships are happening in St. John's and hundreds of athletes from around the world are taking part. Here now, Zach Gowdy is there and joins us now live. So, Zach, what's happening there now? Well, guys, we're watching a team match between Great Britain on one side and Brazil on the other. Just two of the almost 30 nations represented here. Almost 500 athletes competing. And Michelle Critch is a big reason why this is all happening here. Uh, Michelle from my neck of the woods in Grand Falls, Windsor, and back in 2004 became the first Canadian to win at this championship. Uh, Michelle, how exciting is it to have this event here in our province? It's a little surreal for me because it's been a full year in the planning. A lot of hard work, a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of volunteers. It wasn't just me. I kind of put the plan in place, but then if it weren't for the volunteers, it wouldn't happen. And it's just, I, when I had opening ceremonies, or uh, we had our bow in this morning, I uh, felt myself getting a little emotional because I couldn't believe it was finally here. Wow, well, through the bow, you see some of these athletes sort of embracing each other now. They've had a great match. Tell us about the international flavor here. Again, we've got Brazil on one side, Great Britain on the other, and everywhere I look, I see different flags, I hear different languages. It's such a cool atmosphere. It's really cool, actually. And a lot of these people now I know because I've been on the scene since 1994. But I never thought I would see the day that all these people from across the globe end up right here in uh, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. It's just super exciting. Now, I know all these adults have their black belts on, and that's not a style choice. You really are looking at the best in the world. But, Michelle, there's also a Children's Cup event that takes place here. What can you tell us about that? Well, it was always black belts for years, and then they started introducing junior black belts. And uh, Poland decided to see if they can come up with a to get children involved in the, on the international scene. So they came up with a plan called Little Magnificent. And in, uh, in Geneva a few years back, we had absolutely amazing competition with hundreds and hundreds of kids. And it teaches them discipline, you know, it uh, builds their self-esteem, and it gets them to meet new people from around the world and make friends that they may have forever. And it's, it's just so amazing. And actually, there have been studies done that show that children that grow up in the martial art, they actually do better academically, There's, they're more confident. You know, it's just amazing what the martial art can do for them. It builds their uh, uh, human character. It builds their character for sure. Wonderful. It's something you hear about the sport all the time, but being here, I can really, you know, understand what they mean and that martial arts is about so much more than fighting, right? Oh, it's not about fighting. It's a, That's a small part of it. It's about developing yourself, your body, your mind, your spirit, and it's about growing in everything you do. And we come to a competition just to test ourselves, for, to go home for further development. That's what it's about. Well, Michelle, congratulations on bringing this event here. Thanks so much for sharing with us. Thank you so much. And if you're lucky enough to be in St. John's, tomorrow is the big day. There's an opening ceremony at 2.30, and then the championship bouts begin, and admission is free. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now. Hear the collective groan and the rolling of eyes like, oh, yeah, here we go again. It makes you uh, question. Uh, exactly what's going on within the administration and how their the patronage is being taken care of. Controversy at the rooms over what's considered one plum of an appointment. Politicians are weighing in on the high paying sunshine list job handed to a longtime liberal staffer.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, Anthony, it's been quite the week in politics, starting with the House of Assembly back early to deal with uh, harassment and bullying. Uh, also, MHA Eddie Joyce was accused of applying pressure to get a friend a job. And now there are questions about another job with accu accusations of liberal patronage, the appointment mm -hmm. of Carla Foote uh, to a senior position at the rooms. Yeah, absolutely, Carolyn. I guess one of the points that Carolyn makes that's interesting there is on the one hand, you have Eddie Joyce being condemned for applying pressure to get a friend a job, and now questions raised about whether any pressure might have been applied to the rooms. Of course, it is the hot political story not providing any more help to the image of modern politics given the week that we've had. Carla Foote, former Liberal staffer, daughter of Lieutenant Governor Judy Foote, parachuted into a senior marketing position with no competition and a salary of $132,000. Now, Foote is a well-connected former Liberal staffer. She worked with the Liberals as a top communications advisor, first in opposition, and then when the Liberals were in government. And this has got the opposition's attention. NDP leader Jerry Rogers says this week was already enough of an embarrassment for all politicians because of the bullying and harassment. And now this. This feeds into to the cynicism that exists right now about the whole political process. Uh, this is a very significant job. And why this was not, uh, that they didn't put a call for applications is beyond me. Uh, why government would do this is certainly beyond me. And they made a promise in their platform. They made a promise that they wouldn't do this. Uh, I think that this feeds into cynicism. Uh, is Miss Foote the best for the job? Perhaps she is, but we will never know this. We will never know that now. And this puts a, 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 an unfortunate um, pall over, over her uh, position right now. The other thing is, is that when we look at some of the positions at the rooms, which are junior to this particular position, which seems to be created specifically at this time, there is extensive searches for curators. There are extensive searches for the positions of director all over the country to fill those positions. And to have no search whatsoever for this and no call for applications, this is not good. And the people of the province knows this is not good. Now, in fairness, government officials say that Ms. Foote is certainly qualified. In an email, we were told that as part of the way forward, that's the Liberals' economic revival plan, Ms. Foote led the consolidation of marketing functions across government, resulting in increased efficiencies, and that helped to create a success of government marketing activities. Now, when journalists call the rooms, we are told to contact Cabinet Minister Christopher Mitchell Moore, not the CEO of the rooms, not anybody at the rooms, but a political Cabinet Minister. And when we did call Mr. Mitchell Moore this week, he offered this explanation. It was determined that it is a high priority to fill a position around marketing and development at that level and hire somebody at that caliber to do that work so that the rooms can achieve its mandate and its strategic plan. This is why it was imminent that they would hire somebody in that position and Carla Foote was the person that was the contracted person in that role uh, to do the work and she's highly qualified and capable. Well, let's consider this issue of urgency with a little history about this job. An earlier version of it was posted in the summer of 2016, but that job was cancelled in that same year in December. And despite the urgency, it has been vacant for two years until now since Carla Foote landed in that position. Now, when Dwight Ball campaigned to become Premier of this province, long before the way forward, he had another plan. It was called A Stronger Tomorrow. And in that plan, the Liberals promised to restore openness, transparency, and accountability. Also, they would take politics out of government appointments. Now, Premier Dwight Ball campaigned on these principles when he was opposition leader, and he was outspoken when the Tories dropped former PC cabinet minister John Ottenheimer into the top job at Newfoundland and Labrador Housing. And here he is speaking with the CBC's David Cochran about merit in government job hirings. And I see this really as a as a brazen appointment when you get you know, into the late weeks, the late months of this mandate, whether it's John Ottenheimer or not, uh, this, but this is exactly why a position that we've taken and a policy announcement that we have made about an independent appointments commission. Because for me, it's not about your past party affiliation, it's actually having the best people to do the job in those key crown agencies in our province. 
Now, the House of Assembly returns on Monday once again to tackle the bullying and harassment scandal and most likely patronage. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, we are going back to mile one where there's a face-off between some of the world's best karate fighters. Mm -hmm. A world karate championship taking place right now and Here and Now's Zach Gowdy is there. So Zach, we know that there are athletes there from around the world, as you mentioned last time we touched base. Any local fighters there? Absolutely. In fact, I'm standing by with one right now. Sonia Piercy fights out of Michelle Critch's dojo in Grand Falls, Windsor. And also representing Team Canada is Natasha Hebron here from Saskatoon. Thank you guys so much for being here with us. Um, Sonia, to you first, how exciting is it to be here with so many other athletes who share this, uh, your love of this sport? Oh, it's, it's absolutely fantastic to be here in my home province, in my home country for a world event. It's amazing. Um, it really is so cool to hear so many different languages and see all these different flags. But Natasha, I know that you've been competing in this sport for a long time. Help us understand what we're seeing out there. Are you trying to hurt your opponent with your, your punches and your kicks? Definitely not. No, um, what we really want to set up is the perfect distance. And it's maybe just skin contact, but there's no penetration in that. So you should not be hurting your opponent. Wow, and so in the uh, it, it, as fierce as some of these matches look, this is really uh, technically a, a non-contact sport, hey? Technically, yes, it is. I mean, accidents do happen, and sometimes we misjudge, as you can see with some of the matches, but generally, no, it's a non-contact. Okay, well, maybe we can get, uh, it really amazes me, and we talked about the athleticism of the people here and just how close that you can come with those shots without, again, uh, you know, really hurting somebody. Sonia, what do you think? Are, are you up for maybe giving us a little demonstration live on the uh, air? Sure. Okay. I might live to regret this, but let's see. Give me, give me your best shot. Ah! Is your heart beating as fast as mine? <laughs> that was amazing. That was so uh, close. And I mean, just tell us how much practice goes into. Again, you, you know that like what it would take to actually hit somebody, but I bet it's even harder to throw that shot and avoid really making contact with the person. Uh, once you get used to it, I've been training for 13 years now two, three, four nights a week. And so you kind of start from a further distance when you slowly, slowly, and then it's just boom, second nature. And like Natasha said, we're not trying to hurt each other, but when you're trying to touch skin, 
and your target is moving, accidents do happen. I came so. right to the, the whiskers on my chin here. Uh, but Natasha, before we let you go, tell us about the level of competition here. You guys are representing Team Canada, but we're looking at athletes from Brazil, the United States, Great Britain, all over the world. How does our team stack up? Um, actually, considering that, again, we're not a standing team, that most of us have jobs, and this is something we do after work or after school, we do quite well. Um, certain teams like Poland and Brazil, they have a set team. They get paid to do this, and all they do is train. So overall, we're doing really, really well. Amazing. Well, good luck to you both in the competition this weekend. We'll be cheering for you, and thank you for chatting with me tonight. And uh, Sonia, thanks for not taking my head off there. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, guys, again, if you're lucky enough to be in St. John's, you can come on down. They'll be competing tonight until 8 p.m. And the big matches are happening tomorrow. The opening ceremony is at 2.30. And after that, they're going to rumble out here. Great, thanks. All right, so Zach. Much, Zach. <laughs> Glad he's goal. still in one piece. <laughs> Very brave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, was say, I thought for a moment there that uh, Zach was going to get clocked. Yeah. It, it was pretty close. It was close. But if he, he comes back, whiskers. if he comes back to the office, he wants to pull that. Mm -hmm. You first. <laughs> no, thank you. Not me. Not me. He's a brave guy. <laughs>a little cool whether you like gloves or mitts but it certainly is a beautiful beautiful time of the year even though I know we're getting down towards the end of the leaves it feels like yep. it. yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> colors are beautiful and we put out a call on Twitter just to yep. see if anyone would send us some videos or photos yep. of them enjoying all of this uh, beautiful Aww. scenery and uh, we got some good ones you yeah, certainly did a few we'll take a look now <laughs> yeah okay yeah. There you go, a happy grandson. <laughs> this uh, was sent in to us by uh, Catherine Jean Collins. This is uh, her four-year-old grandson and her husband uh, playing in the leaves yesterday. Yeah. There's Pop doing the job. That was one of my favorite things to do. As a kid? Oh, absolutely. Oh, no, even now. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> now there's a video we all want to see, Ashley. Yeah. There was a kid going in there with a lollipop. And it's awful. Oh, oh no. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to do that. but I wouldn't advise that. There we go. Now I'm going to get my revenge on Ashley now. Uh, so uh, where's this picture taken, Ashley? Wait. <laughs>
great question. Yeah. Uh, we did get lots of beautiful photos uh, on into it's our pretty. Yeah, yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. And this one, one, Ashley? Where's this the, one? There's those leaves. <laughs> You're so mean. <laughs> You're not nice. That's near the CBC. That's just down the street there. That's yeah. on University Avenue in St. John's. Okay. I finally get one. Okay, good job. Good. Okay, nice yeah, one. Gorgeous. Beautiful and shot. What oh. a cute puppy. A noble enjoying creature. The, mm -hmm. Enjoying the fall. Very yeah. nice. Beautiful. Very nice. And now she's, she's our, our out there one? playing with the... See? I'm not the oh, only one that right. likes to that's play true. in the leaves. <laughs> yes, it's your playmate. You <laughs> exactly. Can, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, just one little gust of wind right now and all the leaves just gone. Fall. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these winds are going to continue mm -hmm. at least through the weekend. But if you do want to clear some of these leaves tomorrow, you might be able to do that. It does look like a beautiful afternoon. Another day sitting around 8 degrees in St. John's. Some chance of showers in the first half of the day, and then uh, it should clear out. And that's the story essentially across the province. Uh, by the time the afternoon rolls around, we could see the chance of some flurries for Grand Falls, Windsor, uh, even Gander as well, either showers or flurries in the morning, and then clearing skies into the afternoon. Some lingering uh, flurry activity expected along the west coast. Corner Brook only reaching a high near one degree tomorrow. Uh, the winds generally out of the west, 20 gusting 40. Up through Lab City should reach a high near minus 7 tomorrow. Some lingering flurries in the morning as well and then clearing into the afternoon. And that's the story across Labrador. Looks like a beautiful afternoon with some lingering flurries expected for Nain and minus 2. Now, we do have that special weather statement in effect across the entire province uh, for the system that's going to move in Sunday night or rather Saturday night into Sunday. So if we take a look at the future tracker, most of Saturday looks nice. Just some cloudy periods expected into the afternoon. Then that system moves in and it's going to bring in that cloud cover with it. The rain doesn't look like it'll start until towards the early morning hours, but with those colder temperatures, it's going to stick around and we could see that risk of some freezing rain, even ice pellets generally along the west coast. It looks like otherwise the precipitation doesn't look like it'll make its way in before that warm air pushes in. So that significant amount of warm air moves in, changing everything over to rain for the day on Sunday and into Monday, and then it becomes messy up through Labrador. So it's going to start through the overnight as that system continues to track further north, change over potentially to an ice pellet, even freezing rain mixture into the afternoon on Monday and then more rain on the way across uh, parts of the uh, island. So if we take a look at what how much rain we're going to expect now, these are early amounts. That system still uh, more than 24 hours away, but uh, it does look like a good bet that we'll see somewhere between 30 to 50 millimeters into Monday afternoon uh, for most of the province. The Avalon likely closer to maybe 15 to 20 millimeters by the time Monday evening rolls around. So if we take a look at uh, quickly at the five day forecast, those winds are going to pick up likely on Monday, but look at that temperature 17 degrees on Monday for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. That is the story for Western as well, uh, but not before we'll see that wintry mix early Sunday morning and then into uh, central portions in the morning. We'll see uh, 30 to 50 millimeters on Sunday breezy conditions and then into Labrador a gorgeous weekend expected. Uh, we'll see some that snow move in Sunday night and then same thing for Eastern Labrador. Uh, but again, it does look like a nice weekend. So I'll have uh, your weather photo coming up after uh, in a little bit.
Friday. Friday. Right. It is. Time to find out who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Happy 50th wedding anniversary today to Madonna and John Murdoch in Kilbride. Happy 50th anniversary to Leo and Bride Watson from Stephenville Crossing, now living in Montreal. Another golden anniversary to celebrate. Happy 50th to Garfield and Alice Pollard. They celebrated yesterday. Anniversary greetings to Newman and Bella Harris of Summerford, celebrating 55 years of marriage. Congratulations to Wayne and Benita Perry of Stanhope, who celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday. Ed and Ruby Williams of St. John's are celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary today. Congratulations. Also celebrating 55 years of marriage, Golda and Raymond Guy, they're from Leading Tickles, but now live in St. John's. Alice and Michael Mahoney from Colliers, they celebrated their 58th wedding anniversary on Monday. And a happy 90th birthday to Frank White, who is from Greens Pond and now lives in Mount Pearl. Happy 93rd birthday to Julia Higdon from Dildo, she celebrated on October the 22nd. And happy birthday to Catherine Moraze of Three Rock Cove, who celebrated her 94th birthday yesterday. And Florence Bercy is celebrating her 90th birthday today. She's from Buckins and now lives in Grand Falls, Windsor. Also celebrating her 90th is Bonnie Mallard. Hope you had a great birthday. Wishing Lawrence Harris from New Chelsea a very happy birthday. He turns 92 tomorrow. Leo Quilty of Dunville, Placentia Bay, celebrated his 90th birthday yesterday. Happy birthday to you. Happy 50th anniversary to Winston and Geneva Rogers of Hair Bay. Happy anniversary to Walter and Doris Piercy of St. John's. They're celebrating 60 years of marriage on Sunday. And Walter was a longtime CBC employee who is now retired. And both he and Doris celebrated birthdays this week. So happy birthday too. Happy 51st anniversary this Sunday to Louise Hewitt from Tilton and Wilford uh, Hewitt from Fogo Island. We're told they love watching here and now and especially enjoy uh, seeing the birthdays and anniversaries. Yeah, with a kiss like that, can't blame them. Happy 55th wedding anniversary yesterday to Alwyn and Betty Rideout from Robert's Arm. Faithful here and now viewers as well, and thanks for watching. Phil and Mary Shepard from Stephenville are celebrating their 50th anniversary today. And a happy 57th wedding anniversary to Burl and Hubert Humby from Roddickton. Happy 57th anniversary wishes to Jim and Anna Madigan of St. John's. They will celebrate their anniversary on October the 30th. Congratulations to Eric and Viney Stanley from Clarenville who will celebrate their 70th wedding anniversary this coming Tuesday. Fantastic. And a happy anniversary to Fanny and Bill Taylor. They will celebrate 58 years of marriage this Sunday. And birthday wishes to Randall Moulton from Winterland, who will celebrate his 91st birthday tomorrow. Happy 90th birthday to Iris Chafe. She celebrated on October 24th. Celebrating her 90th birthday is Margaret Hinchy of Gander. Her birthday is tomorrow. Happy birthday to Robert Han of Porta Port East, who celebrated his 90th birthday on Tuesday. Happy 97th birthday to Amelia Marsh of Hans Harbor, now living in paradise. 92nd birthday greetings to Teresa Hawkins of Admirals Cove, Cape Royal, now living in Holyrood. Happy birthday to Albert Little, who celebrated his 96th on October 25th. We're told he is the oldest living person who was born in Upper Amherst Cove. 90th birthday greetings going out to Margaret Stone of New West Valley. Gerald and Sandra Windsor celebrated their 50th anniversary three days ago on Tuesday. And wishing Jim and Marie Dix a happy 62nd anniversary. They are from Harbor Buffett and now live in Harbor Grace. And a happy 50th anniversary today to Dennis and Patricia Jones. Happy 55th anniversary wishes to Howard and Jane Tavener in Heart's Content. And a happy 67th wedding anniversary to Bill and Martha Smith in Brookside, Placentia Bay. Happy 55th anniversary to Joyce and Donald O'Keefe in Portishaw. And wishing Arch and Amelia Collins a happy 64th anniversary today. And a happy 93rd birthday greeting to this, this Sunday to Bob Adams in Kitchener, Ontario. And we're told that he watches CBC every evening. Mm, nice. Happy birthday to Phyllis Blackmore. She's celebrating her 93rd birthday. 
Birthday greetings to Lorenzo Whalen of Flowers Cove. He's celebrating his 94th birthday. Happy 58th anniversary today to Isaac and Hazel Genge of Anchor Point. Happy 50th anniversary to Jean and Betty Wall of Shoe Cove. They celebrated on October 12th. Happy 60th anniversary tomorrow to Gus and Lucella James in Trapassi. And a big happy birthday to Lily Hunter. She turned 105 on October 25th wow. and celebrated with her family and friends. And uh, she's actually fr is from Anthony's favorite place in the province, Whoa, Salvage. Salvage, all right. <laughs> and she now lives in St. John's. And we're told Lily is still a very vibrant lady with a wonderful memory. Happy birthday. That's gorgeous. All right, back to fall. Yeah, here's a picture from Tracy Mugford who says, our kids here at St. Mark's School in Kings Cove playing outside in the leaves. They certainly are enjoying themselves. Yep. Look at the smiles. It's, it's <laughs> fantastic. And Anthony, this shot, oh. I got a, a tweet already Can't. saying that uh, you're wrong. It's not St. John's. <laughs> it's Pasadena. Pasadena, huh? And yeah. that's uh, Eugene May. Thank you, Eugene, for correcting me on Twitter. <laughs> Can't even get one. It's, it certainly looks like it's just down the street from it here. Does. And Eugene went on to say, uh, you're wrong. It was not St. John's, as you mentioned, but then she says, St. John's never looks that good, oh. which uh, that's fighting words on this side of the overpass. <laughs> But yeah, we just should do a competition of beauty between east and west yeah. fall leaves or not. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just funny. Right. Well, I'm glad. Uh, glad we got those beautiful photos. Yeah, and no, maybe we, more this weekend. And we didn't get your picture today and this time, no. but we had lots of pictures today. And of course, we'll have your uh, best pictures next week. Absolutely. And uh, also stands to be another very interesting week in Newfoundland politics and Newfoundland Labrador politics. So make sure to tune into here now for the latest coverage and your weather and all the other news. And thanks a lot for uh, watching this week. Have a great weekend. Good night. We'll see you now. Thank you.